cool. So, uh, resource link. What is some um, uh, resource link? What, um, what are the use cases? What are the technical details behind it? That's what I'm, I'm going to cover uh, for now. And um, let me start by uh, briefly looking back of how uh, this. Uh, there's a chat box now. Okay. Okay, cool. so we're all good with the screen sharing? Okay, gotcha. All right, uh, so briefly looking back, uh, the, I'm, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are uh, familiar with the OEI PMH protocol, the protocol for metadata harvesting, which was devised you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and was really meant for as, an, as a protocol uh, to enable recurrent metadata exchange from a data provider to, uh, to service providers, right? And was, as I'm sure you're, you're all aware, it was devised for the exchange of metadata only and for uh, XML metadata only. So in that capacity, it had a very uh, repository-centric sort of a view, and it really predated uh, modern, what we now have uh, come to accept as modern principles of the web. So it was uh, surely prior to all the REST principles and, uh, and, and, and also prior to the, at least what we now accept as the dominance of uh, uh, search engines. Google was around at the time, but surely did not have the dominance that it has uh, today, for example. So out of this initiative, uh, ResourceSync arose, and um, let's check this real quick here. Okay, and um, it was, oops. Uh, we, we sat together and uh, uh, with the objective to devise a framework uh, to enable synchronization of resources from a source to destinations. So these are the two new terminologies that we introduced in this in this context. And uh, everything will um, consider resources uh, subject to synchronization that have a URI and that have ideally a representation. So we do not distinguish anymore between you know, a metadata record and the PDF, for example. It is all about uh, uh, resources. So it is a resource-centric um, sort of a framework that we devised here. And uh, uh, it's been a number of years since we've done this. And uh, we've uh, specified it. We have uh, uh, a technical specification written. It is standardized. Uh, uh, NISO was uh, fundamental in this, in this effort to standardize this approach. And uh, or we submitted an update in um, 2017, I believe. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the technical side of things is really uh, specified and set in stone. All right, so what is actually the problem that we're trying to address with resource sync? Well, consider the case you have a, a source, a server, let's say, that has a number of resources that do change over time, right? They get created, they get updated, they get deleted along those lines. On the other hand, you have a number of destinations that uh, leverage some of those resources uh, from, uh, from that server and hence want to uh, keep in step, want to remain synchronized with those resources and their changes at the uh, source's end. So that's really a very simple sort of problem statement that I'm sure you can all identify with and have faced uh, in, in your professional environment um, frequently. So uh, to depict this a, a bit more vividly, imagine a scenario like this with a timeline on the x-axis. You have a number of resources A, B, and D that are uh, existing at the source's end at time t0. Uh, at some later point in time, you know, resource A gets updated, uh, resource D gets updated at yet a, a, a later point in time. Uh, down the road, resource A and resource B happen to get updated at the very same time. Uh, and resource C is created, and resource D is actually deleted at some point in time. So those are the, um, the sort of scenarios that we envision at a source's end to be happening. Oh, and uh, um, after um, resource C was created, it gets indeed updated as well down the road. Okay. So uh, we're trying uh, to, to uh, devise an approach for this web-based resource synchronization that has a fair chance of adoption by different communities. And by that, I mean, we're really focused on using and reusing existing best practices and existing standards, uh, because otherwise uh, we'll, we'll, we know from experience that the level of adoption will be minimal and uh, the hurdle will be very, very high if we um, just devise something out of, the, out of the blue that has no uh, resemblance or, uh, to, to standards or that's not it's not based on any existing standards in the community. So what is the scope? And, and that's what um, uh, Kathleen, I think, alluded to uh, uh, earlier. 
what is the scope of resourcing? What are the sort of uh, use cases and scenarios that we envision within scope for this framework? Well, first of all, uh, I think an obvious one is the scope of the size of the sources collection. So there, I think, uh, resourcing covers everything from a source with only a few resources. So this could be your small public library, uh, a small museum maybe, uh, small websites, small repositories, or repositories with very few resources only, all the way to repositories and resources, data sets and linked data collections that have a large number of uh, resources, millions of resources uh, that, that we can imagine. So the spectrum here is fairly broad and fairly wide, I think. The second aspect of the scope is uh, the aspect of the change of frequency of the sources, resources. And here we're uh, recovering everything from a very low change frequency. So these are sources where um, resources only change maybe once a day, maybe once a month. Uh, so fairly infrequently all the way to scenarios where uh, resources change very, very frequently in a matter of seconds, for example. Then uh, looking at the destinations and uh, resourcing also uh, in, um, considers a scenario in, in scope where both high latency and lo low latency scenarios are, uh, uh, are conceivable. So that would be a case where a destination says, well, I'm, I'm okay with catching up with the changes of resources at the sources end, you know, eventually, over time. If I'm in sync after a week, that's okay with me. So both scenarios are in scope, just like uh, scenarios on the other end of the spectrum where uh, the destination say, I have to be synchronized within, uh, let's say, seconds of the change occurring at the source's end. Similarly, the coverage of the sources, uh, resources is uh, an aspect of our scope there. So a destination may be okay with uh, just synchronizing with a partial set of resources on the sources end, or it uh, may um, insist in having uh, or being in sync with all resources at the sources end. So there's a, a, a spectrum there as well that we consider uh, in scope for, for resourcing. And then, of course, the notion of accuracy is another one that, um, that we have considered. Uh, cases where a destination may say, I'm all okay if I'm not 100% certain whether I got everything uh, uh, properly and I got the exact bit streams that I was supposed to get, all the way to the other end of the spectrum again where the destination needs to be uh, absolutely sure and needs to be able to verify that the bitstream accuracy is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is there and uh, uh, it's an essential use case for that destination. So there again, it's a spectrum uh, that is in scope. In terms of use cases, there are a number of abstract uh, depictions that I'd like to offer you here. And um, this is basically uh, based on discussions that we've had in the group of uh, editors of the resourcing specification. What sort of use cases would be in scope for the framework? The obvious one really is the one-to-one -one synchronization, right? One source uh, and one destination that tries to be uh, in step, in lockstep with changes uh, of resources on the sources end. So really the one-to-one -one, uh, sort of thing. This could be your, your backup system, like a mirroring system, maybe um, um, something along those lines that you can envision. The one, one, one step up from there, let's say, is the archive.org use case where you have one source and you have multiple uh, destinations. So the master copy uh, paradigm where you have uh, uh, multiple copies of uh, a source, uh, set of resources, uh, let's say around the world, maybe even distributed geographically, right? Next, we have the, uh, basically the inverse of that example. So you have the aggregating scenario where uh, say a destination uh, receives um, or stays in sync with uh, changes and resources from many different uh, sources. So that is the core use case, the DPLA use case here in the US and other use cases that I'm sure you can think of. Next we have the, uh, what we call selective, selective synchronization. That could be a case where a destination is only interested in, let's say, the Spanish language resources from a source, or only interested in the, uh, uh, in the image uh, resources, in the image files from a source, but not the videos, let's say. So uh, as a destination being somewhat selective of, in terms of what sort of resources to, uh, to synchronize with. 
that this, um, from a variety of resources that the source offers. Then we have the metadata harvesting use case, of course, uh, that is basically uh, mirroring the OEI PMH use case, a source that offers um, uh, metadata records and uh, the uh, destination being interested in synchronizing to those. So for these use cases and these uh, notions of scope in mind, I'd like to turn to the uh, conceptual view of, of ResourceSync to give you a better understanding of how the framework can be can be used and what it's really good for what the strengths really are. So remember our scenario of resources, uh, how they evolved over time on our sources end. And uh, now we have these two perspectives, right? We have this, uh, um, the destination perspective and we have the source perspective. So from the destination perspective, if I am a destination that uh, uh, wants to be in sync with resources at a sources end, I'm interested in basically three scenarios, right? I'm interested in the baseline synchronization, which means it's my initial catch up. So I'm, I have just discovered the source over there and its resources. I want to uh, um, um, initiate the first step of synchronization to, to be up to par, basically. This is my first uh, initial catch up operation. From there on, and that's my second scenario, from there on, I'd like to remain in sync with uh, occurring changes at the source's end. So I need a mechanism for incremental synchronization. And on top of that, and I alluded to this earlier, I'd like a uh, mechanism to audit the synchronization process. So uh, for me to realize, for me as a destination to realize, did I get everything that I uh, meant to, uh, to get? Am I in sync or not? And the other side, the sources uh, perspective, what is the sources role in this framework? Well, uh, I'm, I'm interested as a source now to communicate about the state of my resources. And I do this in several different ways. I do this uh, uh, at first, or not at first, uh, one way of doing this is uh, to publish an inventory. That's basically your notion uh, of a source to advocate, to advertise, to make discoverable, this is what I have, these are my resources. This is a, a snapshot uh, in time of the state of the resources that I have as a source. Okay. As a second way of uh, communicating the state of my resources is to uh, communicate the changes they undergo. So I can uh, publish information about the changes of the resources and, um, and I can do this uh, uh, during a, a specifying a temporal interval. So basically saying, uh, between yesterday and today, these are the resources that have changed, and this is how they have changed. Uh, one way of optimizing this, uh, uh, the publication of changes is to actually actively notify destinations of changes uh, at my end, and I'll, I'll get to this uh, uh, later on, how this can e uh, exactly work, but it's a, a notion of uh, uh, optimizing uh, if, in terms of uh, latency for the um, destination to discover changed resources. And what I communicate with these, uh, in, in these three ways is really uh, the, uh, uh, basically the HTTP URI of a resource. Uh, that's the absolute minimal uh, piece of information that is needed right, to advocate anything about a resource, whether it's there or whether it has changed. And I can communicate additional information about those resources as well. For example, the time of the change event, uh, what sort of change event it is, whether it was created or updated, uh, and, and others that we'll see uh, down the road. Okay, so from the sources point of view, if I'm interested in publishing an inventory, then I would publish what we call within the resource framework as a resource list. So this really uh, a mean for the source to advocate all its resources at a snapshot in time, and it enables a destination to do the baseline synchronization. At the very least, and I mentioned this on the previous slide, at the very least, in this resource list, a source needs to uh, provide the resources URI and, uh, and, and, and list uh, the URI of all resources that it has that it wants to advocate uh, through this, uh, the means of the resource list. The process then for the destination to do the baseline synchronization is it would need to obtain the resource list and it would need to dereference all URIs listed in that resource list in order to 
uh, uh, get these resources by means of their URIs. So that is basically a uh, uh, by reference uh, uh, advertising of resources, uh, which means that the destination need to dereference those URIs in order to get the bitstreams of the resources. One way that we offer within the resource and framework to optimize this process is to, for the source, to publish what we call a resource dump, which is basically also an inventory of all resources that it has, but it is, the resources are not communicated by reference, so by means of the URIs only, but also by value. So it's basically a, a, a package, a zip file of all resources that the um, source means to advocate and uh, the process then for the destination uh, to, to, to do the baseline synchronization is it needs to obtain the resource dump uh, and uh, uh, un, uh, basically download the, the zip file for um, the included resources and then get the, uh, uh, get the resources this way. So it's an, uh, a by value uh, approach for advocating and uh, obtaining resources. A little bit of an optimization. Okay, uh, just to go back to our uh, snapshot here of, of resources, if at time tx a source would publish a resource list, then the resource list would contain at the very least the URIs of uh, resource A, of resource B, and of resource C as highlighted here on this slide, right? And since resource D was deleted before time TX, it would not be listed in the resource list. So that's what I meant that the, a, the resource list represents a snapshot in time. At time TX, A, B, and C are the resources here advocated uh, in this resource list. All right, in order to publish changes to enable an incremental synchronization process for a destination, uh, a source may publish a change list. And a change list, unlike a resource list, <laughs> enumerates all resources that underwent a change uh, between or uh, at a particular temporal interval between time A and time B. In the change list also, the source needs to minimally list the URIs of all resources that have changed and the nature of the change which is essential for a change list. So the destination then would again obtain that change list, um, obtain all resources that have been uh, created or updated in order to remain in sync, and on its end also delete all resources that were indicated as deleted in the change list as a way of uh, staying in sync with the source. And here as well, I won't go into details uh, much. Here as well, we opt offer this uh, uh, slight means of um, uh, optimization as uh, in, the, in the sense that the source can offer a change dump uh, in which all resources would be included by value rather than by reference. And uh, to visualize this further, if a uh, source in this case would publish a change list, that in, includes all changes between time y, time ty, and time tz. This change list would include records about uh, resource A and the fact that it has been updated at time tc. The same with resource B also has been updated at time tc. The fact that uh, resource C was created at time td, resource D was deleted at time te, and resource C was updated at time TF. So that already gives you the notion that the change list is somewhat, uh, not somewhat, it is sorted in reverse chronological order, meaning the most recent change event sits on top of the list as a means to make life a bit easier for destinations to determine which changes need to be executed on the local end, on the destinations end as well. Okay, I mentioned the notion of uh, uh, change notifications already uh, previously, and it really is a means of optimizing the communication and decreasing the latency between a source and a destination. So for scenarios where a destination uh, is interested in staying in sync uh, without 
a delay, really, or without a long delay anyways. So the, the point here is that the source may uh, publish, or push out rather, uh, change notifications to known destinations, and therefore actively uh, notify uh, destinations about changes of its resources. The, uh, the process of the payload is the very same thing. Uh, to change notification enumerates resources that underwent change events uh, during a, a particular temporal interval. And uh, the URIs and the change type, of course, need to be communicated as well. The destination receives those changes and then obtains the uh, uh, changed resources by following the URI, by dereferencing the URI, and removes deleted resources as indicated in the change notification payload. So in this case, if I, if I as a source, would send a change notification in, uh, um, encompassing the temporal interval between T0 and TA, I would send uh, the fact that, or the notion that uh, resource A has been updated at time TA. I would send another change notification with a different temporal interval saying that uh, resource D has been updated, and another one with these two update messages, and so on and so forth. Beyond the URI of the resource that needs to be communicated, and in terms of, uh, in, the, in the case for change notifications, uh, the change type that needs to be communicated, there is more information that a source can share about its resources. Uh, we can provide additional metadata information. We can provide links pertaining, pertaining to, to resources that are uh, related to our resources that have changed. Um, so in terms of metadata, for example, we can communicate uh, information about the content encoding of a resource, the content length, the MIME type, the content-based hash, which comes in handy when a destination is interested in auditing whether it has received the correct bitstream. Uh, and in terms of linking to related resources, uh, those are scenarios that uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, we can link to uh, mirrored copies of a document, of a resource rather, um, alternate representations, resource versions, and so on and so forth. I'll show some examples uh, uh, later on in this uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, the way these links are communicated is that the um, uh, relation types, link relation types, uh, either registered uh, in the IANA link uh, registry uh, to enable max maximum interoperability uh, in the way that I know what you meant by using this relation type, right? They're agreed upon relation types. Um, or use your own uh, minted URI for, to convey a particular relation type that then would only be uh, meaningful in your own community or your own local environment. So it is important to understand, I think, that Resource Sync is by design a very modular framework. And what I mean by that is that there is no um, limitation in terms of what uh, capabilities need to be implemented by a source. So a source has the absolute liberty to, for example, only publish resource lists, or only publish change lists, or uh, only publish a resource list and uh, change dumps, for example. So the source can really, depending on its use case, pick and choose which capability it, uh, it wants to implement and which capability are most useful for its, uh, its destinations uh, that can take advantage of the resources, for example. So there's no restriction that says you have to implement A and B and C. So a source can choose to implement any or all or any combination of the capabilities uh, um, specified within the resource sync framework. The source also determines at which frequency to publish any of those capability documents, right? So again, a, a source knows best uh, how often its resources change, for example, and hence can make the best educated decision of whether resource lists are reasonable or uh, appropriate for its use case or not, for example. Or for example, if these resources change too frequently, uh, then maybe a resource list is not a good idea, maybe a change list is a better idea. And, um, a way to depict this uh, is um, uh, I'd like to offer here. So assume a timeline, and uh, the source publishes a resource list at uh, T1, and then chooses to publish another one at T7. Right? 
Uh, it also chooses to publish a resource dump at T1 and another one at T3 and T8 because that uh, matches the use case of the source best for the sake of argument. It also chooses to publish a change list that uh, encompasses all changes to resources that happen between T1 and T2. Another one uh, that communicates changes that happen between T2, T2 and T3. Note that there are no changes between T3 and T4, so the change list published at the later point in time cover all changes from T3 to T6. And then it uh, also um, opts to publish a change dump from T1 to T4, and then later on from T4 to T7. So this uh, is supposed to underline my point that all of these modules are, all of these capabilities are modular. So a source can pick and choose which one uh, uh, fits uh, its use case. And it, the source also chooses when to publish these capability documents. Okay, so a little bit about the technology overview, a little bit about more uh, how this is implemented, uh, what the technical specification uh, uh, includes, and what can be done in terms of the individual capabilities offered by a source here. The basic uh, technology uh, that uh, Resource Sync is based on is uh, sitemaps. And uh, I'm sure you're all oops, yeah, familiar with sitemaps. It is um, a de facto standard uh, accepted and used to a certain extent by all major uh, search engines to, um, to discover uh, resources. And uh, it is the core format throughout our, our framework here. So it is reused in all capability documents for resource lists, change lists, all uh, uh, change dumps, change notifications, and so on and so forth. We have included or we have introduced some uh, extensions to um, sitemaps that are all namespaced with the RS uh, uh, um, acronym in, uh, uh, to represent the, the resource namespace. And uh, as I'm sure you know, if uh, sitemaps have the notion of a sitemap index, so if you are in the situation to include more than, I believe it is 50,000, resources in a sitemap, you're encouraged to create a sitemap index uh, that can then uh, reference to yet another 50,000 sitemaps. So if your, your repository is that large, it holds that many resources, you need to introduce a sitemap index on top of your sitemaps, sitemap. This is what a, a simple sitemap uh, looks like. I'm sure you all uh, have seen uh, a sitemap. It starts with the URL set uh, element and within the URL element block is where you indicate uh, a URI of a resource, uh, and that happens within the lock element. And then there's some uh, attributes and so on and so forth, and the URL block is what is repeated per resource. A sitemap index can look like this, as I mentioned. Um, it links to individual sitemaps, which by themselves can hold up to 50,000 uh, uh, URL um, um, blocks as shown here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, these are the extensions uh, based on resource sync. So we introduce our namespace, of course, and uh, we show uh, RSLN for uh, link uh, um, uh, elements and attributes, uh, RSMD for metadata elements and attributes, uh, which is impossible within the uh, URL set attribute and also within each URL block. We can include links and metadata information as shown here. And the same holds true for sitemap indexes. Okay, this is uh, just an FYI sort of a slide. The uh, uh, resource um, metadata uh, elements and attributes that can be used and that ha uh, are uh, shown in the um, resourcing specification. So for example, we communicate the change type of a resource uh, as an attribute in the RSMD element. And this is also where we, for example, can convey information about the content encoding of the resource and the content-based hash, length, type, and so on and so forth. The link relation types that are used 
uh, in the specification, uh, but that's of course not mutually exclusive to others. These are the ones that, that uh, are currently used in the specification. Um, right, rel alternate to, uh, for example, convey uh, a, a URI to an alternate, or alternate, alternate <laughs> representation of a resource and so on and so forth. And you see that these uh, relation types that we use are all specified uh, uh, elsewhere and, uh, with one exception that I will skip for now. Uh, the link attributes that we can further use to describe our resources are uh, of, of similar nature. And uh, I'll show you some examples um, in a second here. Okay, so what does a resource list and uh, a change notification capability document actually look like? So you notice I will not show you examples for a, a resource dump or a change dump or a change list because those are, uh, let's say we've seen in the past uh, less interest for, for these sort of capabilities. We believe that the combination of a resource list and a change notification is really a winning one in a way that a source can at any point in time decide to publish its inventory in terms of the change list and from there on really actively uh, send out these change notifications. Uh, that seems like a really smart setup for a, um, for a resource implementation. Hence, I'm, I'm showing you, I'm focusing on these examples, but I'm happy to go into details for all, all other capability documents uh, if, you, if you'd like. So this is how I would um, publish a resource list as a source. Uh, I include the RSMD uh, element on top, and I uh, convey the notion that this is a capability resource list. This is just for self-identification, and it, this resource list was uh, uh, represents the state of the source at a particular point in time. And then I have my repeated URL blocks in which I convey the URIs of the resources, um, a last mod stamp that is uh, just from, from, from the sitemap protocol. We can adopt that. And uh, some more metadata about this um, resource, in this case, an MD5 content-based hash, the content length, and the content type, the MIME type of that resource. Right. So fairly simple, really, if you, if you compare that to your baseline uh, sitemap, the extensions needed to, to make it uh, resource compliant are really minimal. So this is just a reminder, uh, and I alluded to this uh, before already, what, uh, uh, how we motivate for, for notifications, right? This is really to reduce the latency uh, for a destination having to pull a source and the source's change list. Because that, of course, creates problems where the destination does not know, uh, generally speaking, when resources change at the source's end and when the source uh, uh, publishes a change list. Right? The destination does not know that, so it has to keep pulling. And uh, that's an optimization problem that is, um, that is uh, tough to solve unless the source actively notifies destinations of changes and it does so by uh, publishing change notifications uh, to known destinations. The uh, um, notifications are currently, uh, there are several different ways of um, implementing notifications as I'm sure you're aware. The, the technical way of, uh, the, of what we have done in the past and what we have um, uh, proposed in the resource notification specification is the transport protocol for notifications being um, W3C standard WebSub, which is formerly known as uh, PopSub Pop Pop. <laughs> so the name has certainly um, uh, improved. And uh, that is, um, um, is one way, the, the way we have currently uh, um, established it in a way that we're uh, featuring basically. It does not mean that there are not, not different technical, other technical implementations that we can envision uh, for notifications here. The payload of that notification is exactly the same as a change list. It's the, uh, this URL set documents. And uh, this is what a change notification payload looks like. Again, I have my uh, RSMD element on the t in the top that says uh, that uh, self identifies this document as a change list notification. And it specifies the uh, temporal interval uh, of um, uh, during which the listed resources have changed in some capacity and the way it has changed is uh, indicated by the change um, attribute in the RSMD element within the URL block that says in this case created. So the resource identified with the URI in the lock element has been created 
and it has been created at the uh, time indicated with the date time stem um, on the bottom of this URL block. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that within these capability documents, we can convey more metadata and we can uh, also include more links to uh, related resources. And I think that's a really important uh, merit of the resourcing framework. And uh, uh, hence, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention uh, a couple of examples here. So the cases that we've detailed in the specification are the ones that we have come up with. Right? This is, of course, not an uh, uh, exhaustive list, so I'm sure you can come up with other examples. But uh, these are the ones that we've come up with in the past. And uh, I'll actually show you uh, examples for two of them, one of which is uh, linking to uh, metadata about resources. So this is really the case where uh, we communicate, for example, in a change list that a particular resource has changed. But we also know that we have a metadata record about that resource, and we can link to that as well to make the destination understand, okay, the resource over there has changed, but it's metadata record that describes the resource that has changed is, uh, is available over here, and maybe I need to uh, grab that as well. Right. Uh, so that's really um, based on the assumption that frequently resources have descriptive metadata records, they have technical uh, 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 metadata records uh, associated with them, like license uh, or rights information, those sort of things. So these are the sort of scenarios that we can envision uh, here. And this is what, it, what a, in this case, a change list uh, looks like with a link uh, included that uh, points to a metadata record. So we have our resource that has changed. In this case, it has been updated. And we include a link with the relation type described by, and we point to an uh, URI that when dereference provides the metadata record that describes the resource with the URI indicated in the log element. Right? So this is really the linking from a resource to its corresponding metadata record that it is described by. And of course, we can envision the reverse of this um, scenario. So here we indicate again in a change list that a metadata record has changed, has been updated. And we also convey the notion, by the way, this metadata record uh, describes a resource and here's the URI to that resource. So it's exactly the other way, other way around, right? The, the, the uh, inverse direction of these linking. Okay. Another example that I'd like to stress here is the notion of uh, alternate representations. So that's the scenario where uh, you have resources that are subject to content negotiation, for example, uh, or uh, resources that have different uh, uh, formats for preservation reasons, let's say, uh, or maybe different languages of a content of an HTML file, for example. So you would use the relation type alternate to indicate that uh, as done here in this example, it's again a change list. And the resource indicated in the lock um, attribute uh, has apparently two alternate representations, one in HTML and the other one in PDF, as shown here. And I can in, uh, uh, use the, the type uh, attribute to con convey uh, that notion, what, what sort of MIME type uh, is to be expected when dereferencing the, uh, the URI shown in the href uh, element here. All right. And yet another one is uh, coming back to the notion of search engines. If you communicate uh, resources, but you would like a search engine to actually index that resource with a different URI, you, you typically use the, the canonical relation type to do that. Okay, really quickly, and I, I realize I'm running out of time. Uh, very quickly, I'll um, go over the notion of how to discover those capabilities. So if you are a destination, you suspect that a source over there somewhere has, uh, is resourcing compliant and, has, and offers some capabilities, how would you go about to discover those? Well, each source, and that is a mandatory aspect of resourcing, each source has a document that is called source description. The source description would link to a capability list, which lists all the capabilities that I just outlined that it has chosen to implement. So for example, a resource list or a resource dump and a change list index in this particular case. So then the question of course arises, how, oh, this is uh, what a source description uh, looks like. Again, it's self-identified to the capability attribute uh, and the links to the uh, uh, individual 
capability lists here. Uh, and the capability list then, uh, as shown here, would link to the individual um, capabilities offered, like a resource list, uh, a change notification channel, and a resource stump. So then the question arises, how do I discover a source description and a capability list? So uh, for the source description, the entry point, if you will, or a entry point, if you will, into the resource and framework, we use the uh, well-known URI um, standard. and um, uh, as such, it is a, it's a mandatory uh, for a source to establish a well-known URI for resource sync and from there make the source description discoverable. And there are other web native uh, ways of discovering uh, components of a resource sync implementation, like with the link relation types and uh, robots.txt discovery uh, files as well. This is just an uh, uh, FYI. I noticed, uh, I mentioned the notion of uh, indexes versus individual f change lists, for example. Within this framework, you use links to uh, um, um, execute basically the, the follow your nose paradigm to navigate throughout the framework. So it's a, a machine friendly way of navigating throughout the framework, not just for humans. And this is what it would look like. From a capability list, you have a, a link to the uh, uh, source description with a link relation type rel equals up. Okay, uh, and I close with a couple of um, pointers and tools uh, because that question frequently comes up. Well, so who's using this and, and, and uh, are there implementations that I could piggyback on? And the question, uh, the answer to the latter question is yes, absolutely. Uh, recently, um, together with the uh, um, folks at Duns in the UK, uh, I'm sorry, in the Netherlands and uh, Peter and his group at uh, Core, we have um, implemented a, uh, um, a source, or we've done a source implementation based in, uh, on Python, in Python. And it has connectors, and that is interesting, I think. It has connectors to um, solar indexes and file systems, so it basically can sit on your file system and you'll be a resource and compliance source. Uh, and in addition to that, just uh, uh, recently, I believe, uh, developers at UCLA have um, uh, added to this GitHub repository a, a OEI PMH to resource sync converter that I encourage you to check out. Uh, we have done some preliminary testing for that and it seems to be doing the right thing. Uh, and uh, again, the, the URI for that, to that uh, GitHub repository where the source code is available uh, is here, uh, shown on the bottom of the slide. Uh, and some more kind of implementations from the past and from other use cases and uh, uh, implementations that we are aware of in the Netherlands and, uh, and elsewhere. So with that, uh, I will close here and uh, I'll hand it over to Peter, who will give you an overview of what uh, he and his group has done uh, at CORE and uh, basically